Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Turkey's intifada against Israel. Is er, er, Let me start again. Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Turkey's intifada against Israel. Is Erdogan serious, or is this just for effect, or some other reason? Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandakar, geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your show. It's always, always my pleasure. So what is Erdogan doing these days? You know, a year ago, he was friendly with Israel. Now he's not friendly with Israel. Um, what happened and what, what are the steps he's taking against Israel these days? Jay, Turkey is a, such a, a player in Middle East Europe. It's in the middle of things and it's always uh, making itself known. And now let's come to this uh, important Middle East conflict and the role of uh, Turkey in this, Jay. So um, I feel the turning point and uh, it's uh, said that the killing of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh was the main uh, trigger point. So um, in addition that the 20 year support that is Turkey has had for Hamas, President Erdogan, uh, uh, the current president, he has known Haniyeh very well and not only treated him as a family member, but as a protege. And uh, Jay, uh, he had invited Haniyeh to address the Turkish parliament shortly before his death. So he's, uh, Erdogan has taken this uh, assassination as very personal. And there comes uh, his uh, um, volatility on the international stage after this assassination, especially. So the first step was that uh, he, Im uh, he has immediately joined South Africa's International Court of Justice in um, the case for against uh, Israel for genocide to prosecute the country. And uh, Jay, um, if we go back and look at uh, Turkish-Israel relationship, we understand that it has never been smooth sailing. It's always been uh, uh, like this. So if you want, we'll go into the history of Turkish-Israel uh, relationship. Jay. Yes. So uh, Turkey recognized Israel in 1949, and uh, Turkey was its only Muslim majority friend at that time, uh, Israel. So, and uh, in the 1990s, um, there was Israeli uh, Israeli tourism to Turkey. There were various free trade uh, agreements uh, signed. There were high level meetings which were done. There was deep intelligence and military cooperation. So it was good going in the 1990s. Then. You see, um, on the other hand, Turkey has also had formal contact with Hamas since the late 1970s. So um, the, it was one of the first countries to recognize the state of Palestine in 1988. And uh, it has established ties with Palestine Liberation Authority, the PLO in the 1970s. Uh, Ankara has also uh, uh, backed the Palestine Authority uh, as per the um, Oslo peace, uh, peace process in 1900. So it has, in all in all, it has never viewed Hamas as an illegitimate terrorist organization. Turkey has always treated Hamas as a legitimate voice of the Palestinian liberation and uh, as a key actor in its struggle for um, against Israel. And in there was an invitation to the then leader Khalid Mashal in 2006. So all these developments, Jay, they have been probed Hamas from the beginning. So Turkey has never been a, a straight friend, if you say. And uh, Jay, in 2010, now this was the main thing, there was an international flotilla where private owned sail ships set across to, um, uh, to end Israel's blockade against in the Gaza Strip. And Israel had responded militarily. And so, you know, you had eight Turkish citizens and one US Turkish citizen, which was killed. So there were loss of lives. And then it was a flare up, like we always see diplomatic flare up. So uh, with the US mediation, then there was a reset done in December 22, when you have uh, uh, Turkey committing to curbing Hamas's presence on its soil also that uh, they're wanting to end the current Gaza war. 
uh, efforts to mediate. And but Haniyeh's assassination, Jay, it again uh, ruptured the Turkish-Israel relationship. And Jay, today, today we have again warships uh, uh, setting sail. Two warships setting sail towards Lebanon, and uh, Turkey has said that it's only just to uh, bring back its own citizens from Lebanon. And secondly, there was uh, yesterday, I think, there was a closed parliamentary meeting. Now, this closed parliamentary meeting, the uh, it, the contents of which will be made public only 10 years from now on. So it was um, a closed door meeting. And uh, Jay, they have discussed, um, they have been uh, you know indicated to discuss that um, Israel's um, att a movement in Gaza is a national security threat for Turkey. They're implying that what Israel does in Gaza will now, in after they finish with Gaza, they will move towards Turkey. So they should treat it as a national security concern. So those are the kind of you know uh, gist of what is the uh, diplomatic uh, relations still now. Is this Turkey or is it just Erdogan? <laughs> Possibly, and like you said rightly, Erdogan. Erdogan. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, um, a uh, autocrat, um, ha uh, hardly a, a democratic person. Uh, he's taken Turkey way over to the right, um, and uh, he's um, favored going back to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, mm -hmm. And and uh, at the same time, his uh, administration has created an economic crisis. And uh, at least uh, a couple of journals that I read indicated that this was not about Israel. This was about changing the subject. And Erdogan merely wants to protect himself from the political fallout of the crisis. Your thoughts? Correct, Jay. Uh, um, Erdogan has always been um, a very, what do you say? He has been a very definitive player in international politics because he's played this troublemaker role between Europe and, uh, you know, he's Europe and Asia, like Turkey is right in this, uh, on the post between Europe and Asia. Erdogan has also played politics which have neither been European in nature, nor Russian and uh, Asian in nature, nor Middle Eastern in nature. He has played the troublemaker in various spots. And why I say this is because he has threatened Europe with uh, refugee infliction if he is not, his aid is not met. He wants to be, you know, now take the Israel issue only. He has joined South Africa in the ICJ just to call it genocide because his uh, good friend, close friend, Haniyeh gets assassinated. Before that, he didn't have this. Secondly, in uh, for NATO cooperation, you need a unanimous um, vote. So uh, Turkey is a member of NATO, and it has been consistently consistently blocking this uh, veto, using this veto vote to block it, uh, uh, backing of Israel action in um, the Middle East. Uh, thirdly, he uses the UN platform to call for use of force against Israel. So why were one these calls made on October seventh or any other day? So, and he plays to, uh, what do you say? Now the flotilla, international flotilla that he sent to Gaza, uh, he's saying it's under, um, just to get his citizens back and uh, not for any military, just humanitarian aid to Lebanon. But it can escalate, Jay. There is so much of escalation right now. If you send something like this, if you interfere mentally like this, they are going to... Um, flare up things and Erdogan has he I uh, also that Jay he has got a lot of support by the Turkish people so they are also to blame he has enjoyed broad based support see a rogue leader like that enjoys support and Netanyahu faces domestic uh, issues so this is the difference between unity in our population Jay a big thing big difference in um, what do you say uh, loyalty amongst population, it's very, very important. These leaders can stand to do anything and uh, they're autocrats and, you know, they they, uh, they take decisions with such uh, strength because they have the backing of these people. It's people, Jay. Maybe they forgot how many people he 
removed and imprisoned because of a perceived coup five years ago. Maybe they forgot that, but he's used the press. He's used propaganda and uh, there, and he's, he's, he's well liked in terms of his move to the right, his move to uh, historic Islam. Um, and he's changed Turkey for sure. And people do support him and they believe him. On the other hand, um, you know, some of the countries and commentators outside of Turkey uh, are really wondering about him. For example, his primary claim here is that Israel uh, has, quote, an eye, end quote, uh, to taking over Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, he has said to his people and, and he has said to the world that he is concerned that Israel's plan is to take over Turkey, which is really total baloney. Um, Israel, uh, you know, it's not even at a border. The only border that, that matters here is the border just to the south of uh, Turkey, which is the border with Lebanon. This is something that makes me think of you. This is geopolitics on geopolitics. You have the Sunnis versus the Shiites. You have NATO. You have the strange position of Turkey in NATO. It's an uncomfortable member of NATO. You have this very strange relationship um, between Turkey and Iran, uh, which is uh, Shiite, not Sunni. Um, I mean, the whole thing is like um, filled with issues and filled with contradictions and strange possibilities. It's very hard to figure out um, why exactly he's doing this and what he hopes to achieve and um, you know, and how other countries around him will react, how the UN will react. And remember, Turkey has a, a strong relationship with the US, how the US will react. So it, you know, it is a um, it is a very interesting moment for geopolitics in the Middle East. And they say that Turkey is the capstone um, of the Middle East. And that means it is, you know, it looks over everything that is south of it. Uh, which is a lot. And you wonder how this will affect things. I mean, he's playing with fire. Do you agree? Absolutely right. You are always spot on on this. And Jay, Turkey uh, kind of holds itself at, at an upper level and he, they talk below uh, and into this Middle Eastern geopolitics. Um, Jay, they, they kind of bring in every hotpot that they can, you know, when they, they have this diplomatic uh, tension with Israel, they will use that to have trade restrictions and blockades with the, like how Turkish companies with the embargo on uh, Israel that they have, they deal with uh, Israel through countries like Greece. Uh, and uh, they have the Mediterranean terminal of Sian, Sian where Azerbaijan oil is supplies, supplied to Israel. So they want to blockade that. They can use to block the commercial airspace. Um, and uh, Jay, we have uh, right now um, Erdogan more interested in the day after. That is, he's more interested in the reconstruction of Palestine. What role he can play in the long-term Israel-Palestine issue. So he keeps himself very relevant in Middle Eastern politics. He meddles in every, every issue. And like you said, when he's talking of uh, Israel being um, a threat to uh, Turkey after Gaza, that is absolutely baloney because he doesn't, uh, he just wants to get, Israel will never target them. Israel is always, always in an existential uh, survival mode. It is never in an occupational or expansionist mode. This, this they use it to, uh, to disguise their own selfish uh, uh, their own selfish uh, uh, at, uh, let to legitimize their attack on Israel. So that's what I can say, Jay. Turkey is playing a very rogue, like we use it very often, but it has to be used for these people. And these religious divides, Jay, these people quickly forget. And they, they unite under the banner of Islam, the Islam brethren. Now, when we saw uh, uh, a few days back, the tweet by Ali Khomeini, uh, Khamenei, uh, he is tweeted on the backdrop of missiles. So they are very aggression. They have a lot of aggression in their speeches, in their statements, in everything. Now, 
uh, Netanyahu has used the UN platform to say uh, and state and declare two conditions in which he will call, give peace tomorrow, stop the war tomorrow, release of the hostages, and uh, end of uh, surrender of Hamas. Declared it. Why should Turkey use the same platform to say use force against Israel? So you see there are two uh, different parts of the coin. One is aggression and one is trying to say that we can do this. The, you know, uh, practical statements. So big difference. Jay. The propaganda is really out of control for him. He makes uh, inconsistent positions. He says things that he really will logically not be able to follow through on. He wants to have an intifada against Israel. He wants to attack Israel. Um, he's got he's got the truth upside down um, to say that uh, you know he's a, he's a brother with Hamas. That's it's, it's part. Of, it's a brother relationship with Hamas, and he supports Hezbollah, and, and he doesn't feel that either of them are uh, terrorist organizations. Uh, unbelievable that he would say this. And, and you know, the fact is, I think he loses credibility, at least with Europe, and he should be losing credibility with us. So but the question I, I want to pose to you, and it's worth some discussion, is how far can he go? Will he go? This uh, So far, it's it's just rhetoric and, you know, sending ships. But, you know, will he go further than that? Will he actually attack Israel? Will he, you know, align with proxies who are attacking Israel? Will he support them, give them weapons? He's got a big army, um, and uh, he's got the protection of NATO, which is they. I'm sure they regret including him. You know, it was a big issue as to whether he should be able to join NATO. Now I think NATO is sorry they included him yeah. because he's a he's a he's a rogue. I'm sorry, he's a rogue. Um, so the question is, how far will he go? He goes to the UN, speaks against them. Uh, he makes outrageous rhetorical statements about them. He says he's he's worried about they're going to attack him. Uh, it was unbelievable. And um, does he? Ha he has the ability, and he has a certain you know platform in the UN, which isn't saying much. Uh, the press is really not supporting him. The Western press is not supporting him. Although I have to say. That I think the you know the 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 Arab press is supporting him. Of course, you expect that. He's got an economic crisis, which they are not talking about all that much. He's got some issues going on in his parliament, but he makes the meetings secret, so we don't know what those issues are. Um, and you know, we're all wondering where is this guy going? Uh, what what will he really do? Uh, is this all for effect? Is it for you know the protection of his failure on the economic side? Um, is it because he wants to get sidled up to Iran? Is it because he somehow agrees with the terror organizations and he's not worried that they would have an effect in Turkey? Actually, they might very well have an effect in Turkey. Um, but my question to you is, uh, what is going to happen here? What is this guy going to do, actually do, aside from talk big mouth? Yeah, you're right. Instead of acting as responsible leaders of sovereign democratic uh, uh, nations, you know, uh, they act as tribal warlords in the desert and, you know, they come on uh, camels and they just say they're going to uh, burn this and bomb this and this, that. They're they are acting so irresponsibly. Jay. And rogue is a word that we use so often because we're dealing, we are discussing such uh, so countries, they don't know what they're talking of. There is a responsibility in diplomacy. There's a responsibility when you're a political leader. They forget that they make such statements which will really uh, put, uh, you know, uh, what do you say? Uh, street fighting at shame, Jay. So uh, just a country attacking a country after another country it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work. Israel has been acting in self-defense after its terror attack by Hamas. Now, if you go and support Hamas and say that after uh, uh, they finish with uh, Gaza uh, and Lebanon, they will come for us and call it a national security threat, Israel. So it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense on the international front at all, and also practically, Jay. And now sending two warships is an act of aggression, whether you're pull, pulling out uh, your own citizens out of Lebanon, but sending two ships, warships in a war zone. And Jay, we have said it a million times before, 
Israel is being attacked on seven fronts and we have never been able to count the media and Turkey and all these other people on the, uh, on, as a front because we are just counting the direct aggression right now. But these poking uh, nations are also to be counted because they remain a potential threat. Now the nuclear option or missile option, 100% they will help. When the ISIS was a problem for the world, who was buying the ISIS oil? Turkey. It has always played a rogue role in every every uh, crisis that the uh, planet has faced. So it has never played a uh, constructive role or a helping hand or nothing. The earthquake happened. Um, countries were the first to come in and help. But how many people do does Turkey help or how much humanitarian assistance does Turkey really give? Now, if Haniye, Ismail Haniye, who's your known killer of mm, so many uh, millions, uh, you know, millions and millions of people and he's responsible for the uh, violence and terror in a, a country like Israel. If you call him as family member and protege, it speaks very lowly of Erdogan. First of all, I'd like to just point out that he's not a nuclear power. Thank goodness for that. Iran <laughs> is, is or will soon be, honestly, a nuclear power, but not Turkey, uh, unless he has resources we don't even know no. about. But um, one one thing is clear that uh, you know this is nothing. This is like you know kick kick the guy who's being attacked by everybody else. Kick him when he's down. Kick him when he has all these issues and all these you know groups of terrorists trying to destroy it, uh, the Israeli state. And there's something essentially unfair about that, and and it's really too bad because in our lifetimes we we can never feel the same way about Turkey again. Uh, he's dis destabilized the region. Uh, or joined in to a, a you know cacophony of destabilization. It it doesn't help Turkey aside from maybe changing the subject from his economic crisis, but it it doesn't help Turkey in terms of geopolitics, and it hurts Israel, and and it destabilizes the region. Um, and I don't I don't know what he hopes to achieve really. I and I, I wish the U, the U S had more influence with him and they could quiet him down but i don't think i don't think that's happened i got to tell you a story though rupmati before we close i got to tell you a story when i was in the service um, i was um, part of the legal team that was uh, advising the commander of pearl harbor and what was uh, what was really strange and unusual was one day a turkish ship turkish military ship which at the time was friendly, uh, came into Pearl Harbor. And they told the commanding officer of Pearl Harbor that, that somebody on the ship had committed a, uh, a, a capital crime, according to Turkish law, and they needed to hang him. They were going to hang him in the morning, and they were giving fair notice to the commander of Pearl Harbor that he would be hung. And the commander of Pearl Harbor uh, turned around and said, "No, no, no, no. We we don't we don't do that here in the United States. We don't do that. You don't have permission to hang him in off the yard arm in Pearl Harbor. So don't do that." And uh, in the morning, at uh, early in the morning, the Turkish ship steamed out to three miles, hung the man, and came back. And, and I thought that was really an interesting introduction to exactly what the Turkish military is like and maybe what the Turkish culture is like. If you read the history books, you know they're pretty tough. And this was an example, modern day military from Turkey being very tough. Um, they essentially thumbed their nose at the commander of Pearl Harbor. Uh, can you tell me what this means and how this may inform our discussion? Jay. Uh, this shows that you know they they believe in this Sharia law of um, uh, justice that is just according to what they they declare command. They'll, the taking of life is very easy under Sharia law. You commit a crime, it's taken there and then. There is no argument or you're not guilty until you're proven wrong. It's always you're guilty when I say you're guilty. Uh, that is the kind of uh, dictatorship that this uh, Sharia law. But brings in. Now, Turkey wants to present itself as part of the European Union, so it doesn't declare it openly as a Sharia law or, you know, uh, openly as a theocratic society. 
uh, it gives the cloak of uh, being a liberal, open, tourist-free, uh, tourist-attracting uh, nation, when in reality it is not. It is very much a part of uh, a very, what do you say, a fanatic uh, uh, state which supports all the wrong things. It supports ISIS, it supports Hamas. What is, how much proof do you want that Turkey is very rogue and very uh, blatant in its support for all things illegal, uh, ter terrorist and uh, um, anti-peaceful in the world? It has done this, and when it stands on uh, these international platforms like NATO, UN, it undermines the legitimacy and authority of these very organizations themselves. So, and he has no, see, nobody's stopping him and saying, uh, uh, you're wrong when you talk about uh, Israel uh, uh, coming to attack you. It's just a false allegation that they make and uh, legitimize their uh, role in Middle Eastern politics to enter this conflict. And uh, Jay, to the extent that how NATO is a security cooperation uh, amongst um, under the banner of the US to help all those people and uh, uh, come together if you have an aggressor like that. Iran is now planning an axis of resistance in which all these people will come together. Hamas, um, uh, what do you say, all the Houthi, Houthis, Turkey, Iran, all these people want to come together. If anybody attacks, it's going to be known as the axis of resistance. Now, Iran fears this. Turkey supports it. Uh, all these people form this axis because they have one common enemy. They take Israel to be enemy. And the enemy is not decided on any other ground other than religious grounds. So uh, there is no legitimate reason for Turkey to take enmity with Israel rather th other than just having a unknown interest in wanting to destroy Israel or disturb Israel. So that's the way, Jay. Uh, Turkey is unnecessarily meddling in Israel uh, uh, politics. Unnecessary. Well, you know, he's, uh, he's kind of moving the needle in Turkey. You know, he's been trying to get back to the Ottoman Empire, been trying to get back to Islam. And the public, you know, the population is agreeing and largely supporting him. Um, but I don't know if they realize that what he's doing now is destabilizing the region, destabilizing his relation, their relationship with NATO, Western Europe, and the U.S., and certainly Israel, any rational approach to problem solving in, in the Middle East. But there's something else, though, and I would like your thoughts about it. He's an autocrat. He's sort of coming out as more and more of an autocrat every day. Um, and he is using falsehoods to, you know, gain popular support. And Turkey, therefore, must be changing. The needle must be moving toward Islam, uh, toward autocracy, and toward anti-Semitism, um, toward all those negative things we see in the Middle East, it's very troubling, and it should be troubling to them. But obviously, they're they're kind of the victims in a way of what he's doing. Your thoughts about how the country is changing internally? Internally, Jay, I feel uh, the Turkish people are a reflection of their leader, <laughs> if I may say so, because Germany has been one of the first countries to throw out fourteen thousand Turkish. Uh, uh, um, immigrants, you know, so it's a re-immigration process that has taken place, first of its kind. Uh, and Jay, when Turkey joins uh, the Schengen uh, um, zone and the European Union, it wants people to move around, not an influx of Turkish migrants into Europe, you know. So that's what happened. So their kind of this aggressiveness that I talk about is one-sided. It's never been... Uh, and the 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 what do you say the reaction of the Europeans will be termed as you know being too um, harsh and you know anti-immigrant policy and all that. But then you have to understand that why is this being happening? Because there has been an influx of migrants for the last two decades. So uh, uh, this kind of uh, coming into your space is has been a trademark of Turkey. Uh, it's neither being European nor Asian. They have meddled in both affairs. And Jay, they have ambitions to become a regional power. So when we are talking and studying of uh, 
Saudi Arabia and Iran trying to uh, prove their metal and trying to be super power, uh, regional powers. You have Turkey who's trying the level best to play a regional role. And if you want to play a regional role, that does not mean you support Hamas. And I don't know. They have equated this to if your entry into the uh, Middle East conflict is to support the Hamas and enter. It's wrong and it's uh, uh, misdirected uh, in your mind because, Jay, Turkey never has been a valid player in Middle Eastern politics. Never. But it wants hmm. to. Ambitious. Well, okay, we're almost out of time, but uh, given the conversation we've had, I would like to ask you one more question, if you don't mind, Group Mahdi. So here we are, we, the United States, we, mm -hmm. Kamala Harris, and for that matter, Donald Trump, looking down, you know, to an election in a few weeks, and we have to figure out what kind of policy we're going to have. I mean, we need to have a foreign policy against mm -hmm. a country this 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 militarily armed, um, this connected with NATO, uh, who is making you know this, these awful rhetorical statements and destabilizing things in the Middle East, we need to have a policy. What should that policy be? I know it's a hard question. <laughs> Jay, after 2010, um, you know, the US has been so proactive in trying to bring back relations normal between Israel and Turkey because of mainly those a couple of reasons that I told you, the closing of the airspace, the oil fields, Greece, all these points that they bring in to stop that extra excessive baggage that would come in. So uh, US has always taken the uh, help of UAE in trying to rein in Turkey and uh, it has always succeeded. And uh, Erdogan has always uh, wagged his tail for money. So if you give him monetary benefits, he really does listen to you. And that is what is happening every every um, now and then that he has listened only if, you know, he gets money into him. He has been buying ISIS oil. How does that money come in, you know? He has uh, been sending, if you, if you don't give me the aid, I will send migrants inside uh, the uh, European territory. So I'll be the first point of uh, stoppage for migrants. If you don't, he sends the migrants. So he has always just used this. Econ and like you said, his domestic economic uh, um, setup has fallen low. He has just got 35 billion in Forex uh, reserves right now. So uh, Jay, he has uh, used just economics, politics to such a um, mishandle. He's mishandled both of them. He's never been able to play a good decisive role like UAE has really come up to the level of playing a mediator between uh, the hostage situation. It has come in well. Uh, Saudi Arabia has played its part well. And, you know, if you see Saudi Arabian politics, it has uh, picked up a political agenda, an economic agenda and followed. Like that, Turkey is wayward. Hanye dies. A country can't be emotional. A leader can be emotional. but Turkey can't get emotional about the killing of a terrorist. So that is where it falls wrong. And the US has to be a little bit strict, Jay, when dealing with uh, these countries, because any amount of appeasement at the end of the day does not appease such a thick-minded um, nation who has got its mind set on just the destructive side. Like if it had little bit of uh, responsiveness, we could have said that we can handle them this way, but they are not going to be responsive. Jay. You know, one thing that strikes me from this discussion now is that, um, you know, the, the EU and NATO, they're not necessarily on the same page anymore. You have um, the positions taken by the government of Germany are one thing, the positions taken by Macron about Israel hmm, are another thing anti-Israel lately, making all kinds of statements not dissimilar uh, from uh, Erdogan. Uh, and then you have um, you have these two candidates running for president. And in the U.S., it, if you look from the European side of the U.S., you see um, you know, a difference of opinion at the very least uh, between these candidates and what they're going to do. And so we have a moment of, what will I say, contention, confusion, both in Europe and in the U.S. 
about what's right and what's wrong and what policy should prevail. And so it seems to me, and I'd be interested in your thought about this, is that Erdogan selected this moment to take advantage of a vacuum in policy, both in Europe and the U.S. What do you think about that? Is that part of his choosing to make these statements to get his population excited now at this moment? Yeah, Jay, any kind of anti-Israel rhetoric uh, brings uh, this population, uh, give this, gives this population an adrenaline rush because they have this hatred within their hearts. Now, Jay, take a moment and think. If this Iron Dome and if this defensive system, David's uh, sling and arms, uh, everything would not have been so effective and the bunkers and the protection, IDF, everything would not have been so uh, resolute. Today, that country would have been destroyed with the amount of ballistic missiles and missiles that have fallen in the 10 million uh, population of Israel would have been destroyed completely. Does the world not give a second thought about this, that the country has defended itself time and again? Otherwise, the entire ballistic, one ballistic missile falling is a different thing. Today, the world is silent when, you know, a country has bombed so many missiles and um, Iran has come in with ballistic missiles, 400 missiles, drones, everything, second attempt. That country is saving itself. But still you have people saying that that country will finish with one Lebanon and come to attack us. That I mean, it doesn't make any sense on, the, uh, on, on board because this is fake. This is fake rhetoric. This is creating a narrative where it is not needed. Everybody has to appreciate where uh, Israel can be, take the side of Israel very resolutely because it's a country fighting against terror and it's not hidden terror. It's there for people to see on their screens, on their mobile screens, laptop, television, anything. There are that country is being bombed day in and day out, one day or one hour when it's not being bombed. So calling for an attack or use of force against that same country is just. Um, what do you say? Fake and uh, very aggressive and J uh, to the lowest point that uh, politics can dip. J. That is the thing. Moral outrage. Well, thank you so much, Rupmati. Rupmati Khandakar, geopolitical analyst, for this very important and very incisive discussion. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thank you for watching and thinking about these issues. Aloha. Aloha, Jay. Thank you so much.